Okay, so uh, we're going to focus mainly on the birds that are in the area during during the winter months. And if there's an interest, we certainly could do another presentation on spring migratory birds that come through the area. I always like to start out about what do birds mean to us. And I, if you think about birds, they really are through history, messengers from the spirits and also um, symbols of love, peace, luck, longevity, freedom, power. Uh, the cranes have been part of ancient culture for many, many years. And if you've ever been able to be around cranes, they, they're magical. They really, they really have a magic. And so we just have this spiritual connection to birds in, in our world. The other thing is that birds have had a place in our religious history too. Um, if if um, those of you that that know the the Bible, uh, the Noah had sent doves to determine if it was safe to leave the ark, and when the dove returned with olive leaf, Noah knew that the waters had subsided and the earth was good again. So we always have associated birds and doves with, with peace and with wholeness. Okay, a little, little facts about birds themselves. Um, we all know birds have feathers uh, and sometimes the feathers can be very different. For example, I've, I've been um, to trips to see uh, penguins and a lot of people look at a penguin and, and sometimes their feathers are so dense and thick you don't even think of them as, as feathers, but all birds have feathers and they have wings. Even the flightless birds do have little things that are, are light wings. Uh, birds have hollow bones to help enable flight. I don't know if you've ever have been banding a bird or had an opportunity to pick a bird up. Even the, the largest birds are so light because of their hollow bone structure. The other thing is, as we know, birds, birds lay eggs and, and they are, they're, they are warm blooded. Uh, there's some speculation that birds have evolved from dinosaurs. Fascinating things is some bird species create and use tools. And the bird on the right-hand side is a green heron. And there've been times where I've even seen green herons go to the shoreline, get a little stick, drop it in the water. And what they're doing is they're trying to get the fish to come for the bait, thinking that the stick might be an insect. So um, there's also other evidence of birds using sticks to be able to probe in and get insects. Uh, so they're, they're really amazing. There's about 10,000 different species of birds and I put an approximate here. Um, in Virginia, we have more than 450 different species identified. We're really fortunate with the variety of bird species that we have. Gabe, would you add anything to this about facts on birds that from your observation is really important? Um, um I, back to the more than 450 species of birds. It, yeah, we are very fortunate in Virginia to have so many different species of birds that's due in part to a very large variety in habitats from the mountainous regions in Western, in Western Virginia. With high elevations, we get breeding birds like juncos and black-capped chickadees, which throughout the, the other state, the rest of the state in the summer aren't very common. And we get a lot of different breeding warblers. And then you have your coastal plain and your kind of lowland areas in the middle. And then you have your coastal areas and we have the, almost the entirety of the Chesapeake Bay, which is a really rich environment. And um, then we have our coastal areas in like Northampton and Accomack County. And so all that combines to have to, for a state to have a, a ton of different species of birds. And on your 
personal bird list of the 450 species, how many in Virginia, do you know approximately how many in Virginia you've seen? Uh, 275 around that. I'm not quite sure. So there are people who have seen more than me though. <laughs> Good, thank you. So uh, I wanted to reference, there's a number of different books out on bird behavior, but there's a brand new book that just came out. And for people just wanting to learn more about birds, it's really a, a fascinating organization and way the book has been put together. It's called What It's Like to Be a Bird by David Sibley. And the front of the book does it by different types of characteristics or functions of the bird. So you might have a whole bit of information on feathers, on, on nesting, on eyesight. And then after he goes through this uh, summary of just different functions, he then picks different species and talks about what it's like to be that species of bird and going back and, and identifying some of the different different things that he put in the front of the book. His drawings are, are really beautiful. If you use any of the Sibley guides, you know that what he tends to do is exaggerate unique features a little bit, but it's a, it's a really beautiful book and it's a, a great introduction for getting into really in, enjoying uh, and understanding bird behavior. So birds in winter, uh, I like photographing birds in winter because they they tend to puff up their feathers and to keep warm. They, to me, birds in snow are just really, really beautiful. Um, and as all of us know that have had things with, with feathers is that feathers are an incredible insulating different layer. And um, Sibley talks about the feathers and how they really um, can be waterproof too on, on some species. And sometimes if you see a bird standing on one leg, they'll, they'll tuck their other leg up into their feathers to keep, keep uh, the heat from, from losing through their, their legs. Some of our wading birds, such as our great blue herons, sometimes you see them standing in the water. I've, I've been to Japan and I've seen the, the red crown cranes um, standing in ice water and, uh, and ice forming around their legs. The wading birds have a way of doing heat exchange so that they don't lose their, their heat at night standing in water where they're roosting for safety through, through their legs. It's, it's a whole system that they use. And a lot of small birds will gather in groups at night in crowded tight spaces and they share, share their, their heat and their, their body warmth. So birds are remarkable that they can survive in some of the temperatures that um, they need to overnight in, in the winter, especially given, and you think about this area is that one day it can be 50 degrees and then the next few days it can be really cold. And, and the fact that, that our birds can adapt and, and survive these conditions. They're, they're quite remarkable. So let's talk a little bit about bird identification. And if you look at these three different birds, um, what, you, what you notice is a couple of different things. Um, you can notice their coloration, you can notice their feet, you can notice their, their bills or their beaks, where their eyes are, size, um, different types of behavior. And all of that goes to being able to identify um, birds around you. So what we do is, is look at size, and this is a quick reference guide to sometimes the way the different bird identification, they'll compare them to other birds. And so, the top graphic shows you, is it tiny like a kinglet or is it larger like a hawk? Um, so one of the things is to understand size of birds. That's helpful. The thing that helps me a lot, if you look at the silhouette graphic in the bottom right, 
is how's the bird perching? Um, a lot of times I can be driving and I can identify a bird based on its posture of, is it upright? Is it slanted? Um, what way is that bird acting? Uh, because birds tend to, because of their bill, built and their features, they tend to be at rest um, in very different ways. Uh, so that's one of the, one of the things that, that I look at when it, identifying birds. There's also field markings in every book that you go into. Um, the front of the books will define these different field markings. And, and the language is pretty universal in terms of, of what's used. Um, and this can, this can help you once you have narrowed down from saying, how big is the bird? How is the bird's posture or how's it, it sitting? Then you can go into a much more detailed identification of saying, yeah, you know, what's what's on the rump on the on the sort of backside or, or the bird's area that sometimes I call the, the butt. What does the teal look like? What's the crown? What's the shape of the beak, throat? These are different areas that can help you, particularly when birds that that look alike and may only have one or two unique field markings. But if you're new to bird identification, what I recommend is for you to look in the front of all the guides and get familiar with the terminology that's being used to identify the different birds. And one of the most telling thing in identifying a bird is its, its bill or its beak. Um, and so you can see the difference between the bird on the left, which is a woodpecker, um, a red-bellied woodpecker, and they're sharp for drilling, whereas the chickadee's uh, bill is more all-purpose and it's used to um, do a number of things. It eats seeds, it catches insects. Uh, if you have a feeder, the chickadees, I'm always amazed they're having to take one, they'll take one seed and then they'll fly to a tree and they'll have to break it open. Whereas my finches are sitting there eating about a hundred seeds for every one seed that the poor little chickadee is doing in terms of opening up that, that one seed. But the first thing I look at besides the behavior is what, what is the shape of the bill or the beak? Because that's gonna tell you a lot about what that bird is and what that bird eats. So here's an example of a number of different of birds with very different bills. Um, you see the, the, the swan, um, that bill is used for being able to do filtration and eating aquatic, um, whereas the snowy owl, and this is a snowy owl that was, um, a, it's a rehab owl that um, Dr. Burwell has. Um, it was found in Winchester a few years ago when we had snowy owls coming um, further south. And it's, it, she tried to, um, to repair its wings about three times and it kept taking the pins out of the wings. But you can see that bill or beak is used more for being able to rip um, prey uh, that's caught in the, in the bird's feet or talons. And then in the bottom is our ruby-throated hummingbirds that um, every April I, I look forward to their, their arrival back in this area. And that's obviously a bird that would eat nectar and probe into flowers. So very different. Um, they're all birds, but uh, they have very different beaks or bills, and all of that is usually related to what do I eat and what tool do I need in order to be able to get my food and to be able to eat it efficiently. The most important thing for me is, um, is to look at behavior of a bird to identify it. So I tend to start to say, you know, what is this bird eating? Is it eating insect seeds? And birds will, and we'll talk about this later, they eat different foods in the winter versus the summer, depending on uh, what 
what is available and what nutrition they need and if they're in a, in a breeding cycle. Uh, is it taking its food from the tree or the ground? Because uh, definitely different birds will live at different places within a habitat. And that's sometimes why you see mixed habitats or birds is that they're able to, um, to specialize in different places within the habitat structure. So you might see a bird on the ground and one in the middle and, and then one up much higher. Um, does it hover or does it soar? Is it in the forest or open fields or is it in a marsh? That, that really will help identify who this bird is. Um, again, does it like to be in the, in the top of the tree, live on the ground? And also um, time of year. And time of year is important, but with our crazy changes of weather, sometimes we're getting, we're getting birds that are staying longer or not migrating sometimes. Uh, but it's uh, time of year will tell you because some birds migrate based on weather, some do it based on, on daylight, but it will help you to narrow down and identify what bird you really have there. Before I go on, I, I would like to open it up. Um, Gabriel, would you add anything else about, in your experience, what is most important in trying to identify a bird? And I'm, I'm gonna get to song. So just in terms of behavior and, and what they look like. With behavior, you did pretty good explaining that. Like, uh, but behavior is so variable that it's, it's a really helpful thing for bird identification. A good example of that is the ruby crown kinglet. Ruby crown and golden crown kinglets look very similar except for their facial features. But one of the easiest ways that you can identify a ruby crown kinglet is if it's just flicking its wings very energetically. Another example of this is a, like flycatchers. They'll sit on a branch and then they'll sally forth and then come back to the same branch after catching a bug. Those are two very good examples of that. Um, bill shape is very variable. Um, you already touched on that though, but behavior is one of the main ways that I identify birds and there, there is a very easy and helpful feature once you learn it. Yeah. And, and what you said about flycatchers is, is really true because one way I can quickly identify a Phoebe from a peewee is whether or not the teal, when they're sitting, they're bobbing their tails. Yep. Some birds yep. will bob their tails and that's like, oh, now I know which bird it is. So, you know, the, the most important thing about birds is taking the time to really watch them and to be quiet and, and not have your presence affect their behavior. And then you can start to say, I understand this bird. And next week when we do bird photography, I'm gonna emphasize over and over again that a good bird photographer knows bird behavior. So I can anticipate what that bird's going to do um, and where it might be and not have to rush to photograph the bird because I say, ah, I think if I just sit quiet, I'm gonna get some natural behavior. Uh, so, it, and to me, I started watching birds because I love the interaction between birds, particularly when you get um, birds together in the spring when they're starting to um, pair up and mate and what do, what do the birds do? So be, bird behavior is so important and to me, to really appreciate birds, that's, that's where the, the joy comes to. This is a little bit more advanced field markings. I'm not gonna spend time on them, but I just urge you, um, if you really do want to get further into the identification, the fronts of all the books have really good explanations on field markings. Okay, so why do birds sing? That's an, another whole way to identify birds is by their voice. And there are some birds that you're going to hear and you may never see as much. And a perfect example of that is that in my neighborhood, there, there are um, owls. And for every time I've heard an owl, I've probably heard owls um, 50 times to one time seeing them. 
Uh, so bird song becomes yet another way of identifying. And it also is, to me, along with behavior, just listening to birds uh, sing and chat and talk to each other. It's just really part of the part of the joy. So there are two types of things that birds will do. And some birds have many different calls and songs. Others are more singular in, in their vocal expressions. But there are two things with birds. One is a call. And I don't know if uh, I'm going to play this. It would be interesting to see if you can hear it on my. So what it sounds like is a little tit 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 or sometimes when, when I know that um, birds are upset, they have alarm calls to tell each other, careful. And you, they're usually one or two notes that repeat. A song is usually more um, rhythmic. It's a series of notes. Uh, and some birds are really beautiful in their songs. Some of them, their songs are not as pretty. And the amazing thing about bird songs is some of the Tiny birds have some of the loudest voices, like uh, an example of that are our wrens that um, just can, I had a, a wren that was near my, my ear and it let out a song and I, it was like being at a rock concert. It was just, it was like, whoa. But the diagram below shows how um, birds, how their songs actually are put together from a physiological standpoint. Um, I'm going to go to Gabe on um, anything more on bird songs or calls. Um, you talked about it pretty good. Um, one of the ways that's really, it, it, I found it really easy to learn bird songs by just being out in the field and listening. And then I, I'll hear a specific song. Like say I hear a song, it's kind of harsh. And it sounds like Phoebe, Phoebe. And I'm like, huh, what's that? And so then I go and I look for the bird. And then once I make the visual connection with the, so with the song that I'm hearing, it's really easy to remember for next time. But another good re other good resources are like apps on your phone that can play um, bird songs for you, or you can go on the internet and uh, listen to them and then remember it for later. But the problem with that is there are, uh, that bird songs are very, variable and in fact an example of this is i have a um a friend who teaches um uh ornithology at a school in northern virginia and he was teaching his students about bird songs and calls and he played about 20 different calls and he asked his students what what the calls were what what birds made those calls and every single one of them was a carolina wren now all, now all the students came up with very different answers. So get, it's a good to get familiar with your typical birds that you have in your area. And that way, uh, when you hear a bird that you're not quite sure of what it was, and it, especially if it's not from the area, you can look for it and make a visual connection and stuff like that. So in terms of different resources, um, Gabriel mentioned apps. Um, there are a number of different apps. Some of them are free. Some of them have a little bit of cost to it. Uh, one of the apps that is sort of amazing is, is called Merlin, and it works both on, um, on Apple and Android devices. And if you have a picture, if you take a picture and you put it on your iPhone or take it with your iPhone, if you're lucky enough to be able to capture a bird on the iPhone, it will, it will go through and identify. And I've tried it and it, it really does work. Uh, but there are numerous different apps that you can download. And it used to be in the old days when I first started birding, one of the things was all your field guides that you took out in the field with you. And now you can, <clears throat> now you can have them all on your, on your phone. And there's different ways to search them. You can search them by color and size and region and different types of things. And then, it, and then they have 
sound that's linked to them. It's, it's really made birding and identification much easier. <clears throat> there's also a reference of a couple of different websites. Um, and then there's numerous guides. <coughs> Even though um, I use my apps on my phone, I still like to have the, the books and the apps um, the books to supplement the apps because there's nothing like really sitting down with the book and being able to study the page and, and really look at birds. And for those of you that have um, younger children, uh, the All About Birds site, which is, is Cornell, there's great downloadable free lessons that you can do and activities for children. Uh, and there are some really great first birding books for, for children. And even if you're new to this, if it feels overwhelming, there's, there's even some pamphlets that will, that just tell you about the birds in, in your backyard. So um, guides are great. And everybody has their different preferences on guides. I started with Peterson. And so my old, I have a really old version of Peterson. And I still like that for identification because I'm so familiar with it. But the problem is most of his maps are out of date. So I tend to have lots of different books around, um, around to if I'm trying to narrow down an identification. So a little bit about resources. So I'm going to transition if there's if there's no questions on this and talk about the birds that we commonly will see in, in our backyards uh, and in the different areas uh, around the valley. So the first one is our Carolina chickadee and um, they are here year round. And a couple of identification marks are they have their black cap in, a, in the bib in the front and they have white cheeks. Their back um, and wings are soft gray and they're pretty, they're small. Um, and in, in the Cherokee language, chickadee was associated with truth and knowledge. And I'll play the song. So typically here we get Carolina chickadees. There's another chickadee that, um, that would be common if you were in New England, and those are the black caps. And on occasion, we do have black caps that are here. And we also have found that the Carolinas and the, and the black caps do interbreed. Uh, Gabriel, more about chickadees and... You were talking about um, uh, black cap chickadees sometimes coming down. Uh, this is actually one of those years that black cap chickadees are coming down south. That's it's called an eruption. It's when food up north is low and uh, they come down south and eat. So you can uh, find chickadees at your feeders right now. The main difference between Carolina and black cap chickadees is well, first, black cap chickadees are larger. Uh, they're about the size of a titmouse, and they have a bright white hockey stick shape on their wing. That's uh, one term that birders use for it. Um, they have, it's, it's very bright white, and then they also have a bit more ragged bib, or the black part underneath the throat, um, and they also have a different song, while the Carolina chickadees has a four-note song that kind of goes dee-doo-dee-doo, the, the, the black cap chickadees have a two note song that's just, that sounds like dee doo doo or something like that. I'm terrible at imitation, sorry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And so what um, Gabe was talking about with the hockey sticks, if you look closely at the picture on the screen, you see the white going on the back. The white would come up to, uh, where where the and I don't know if you can see my arrow, but it would be it would extend and come across the back a little bit. Uh, and if anybody thinks that they have black cap chickadees at their feeders, uh, 
Rob Simpson from uh, Lord Fairfax, he was instructing there. He really wants to know because he he studies the the black caps. But uh, I just uh, they're one of my favorite birds because they're really spiky and and really um, I love seeing them coming into my my feeders. So and they're here year round. What did he like to eat, Sharon, in the wild and also at your feeder? So at the feeders, they, they eat sunflower seeds and they will also eat safflower. And the reason I put safflower out is because the squirrels don't like it. It's, it's more costly, but um, that's, that's what they, they come for the sunflowers. They will on occasion, I see them on my suet feeders uh, just to get a little bit more protein. Uh, in the spring, they will also eat some insects. So, but, but yeah, they, they really, and they love to bathe. That's the thing about chickadees is if you put out, and they like it in shallow water, I have some really shallow places for birds to bathe. And even in the middle of the winter, they'll just, they'll get in and they'll splash. And, and so they just, they really love it. Birds need water to clean their feathers. Uh, so another, another bird that would sort of, has the same coloration of the chickadee that uh, we see year round here are the white breasted nuthatch. And um, that's the bird on the left hand side of the screen. And they are gray blue on the back. They have a frosty white face and underparts. Um, and the way you know that it's a white breasted nuthatch is that if you watch it on a tree, it can go either up or down the tree uh, when it's looking for food. And other nuthatches can only go up because of the way their feet are. are. Uh, but these guys go up and down. Uh, and oftentimes you'll see them coming. Uh, my, my deck has wooden poles. And so I see them hanging um, upside down, coming down the poles. Uh, and The call is sort of like a hysterical laugh, you know. And I sometimes remember it by saying it's a nutty nut hatch that they're a little bit nutty in terms of their their um, their call. They also, if you watch them with another nut hatch, or when it comes close to to breeding, is they're really funny in the way they walk. And if you, if you see them like on the reeling of my deck, they'll be walking back and forth. And to me, they, they look like spy versus spy, like from the comic strips, because they, I, when they're, when they're um, just parallel on, the, on my deck, they, they look like they have a little raincoat on and they'll, they'll like walk up to each other and, and just puff their, their, their chest a little bit. And they're just really fun, fun to watch. We have another um, nut hatch that will be here. So the, the white breasted are, are year round. The red breasted, which is the picture on the right hand side, um, is smaller and will not walk up and down. It's really, really pretty bird. It has a little bit of, of red russet more than the nut hatches will have a little touch of it, uh, the white breasted, but the red breasted are, are much redder in the chest as you can see in the photo. They're smaller. Um, and last year they were regular at my, my feeders. This year I saw them in the beginning of the winter, but I haven't seen them as much um, and I always get excited. But look at the difference. This is a good example of field markings is that yes, their behavior and their, their beaks are the same. The red breasted is much smaller, but look at the eye stripe. One of the things to identify birds is look at what type of markings do they have through the eye above or below it. Uh, so yeah, if you see the red breasted, they're, they're, just, they're just so pretty. I, I love when they come. <laughs> so also in that family, um, when I see the chickadees and I see the nuthatches, 
sort of the trio member is the tufted titmouse. And they're softer gray. Um, they, they have the little black mark above their, their beak, but the young ones don't have that. Like in the spring, you might see a titmouse and the face will look a little tiny bit different. It's just a, a younger bird. And they have that little crest on the top of their head. Um, they're just, they're just a, a really funky little, nice little bird. Um, and and their, their name comes from, from the root of, of um, the Anglo-Saxon root of tit, meaning small, and mouse, meaning um, applying to any small bird or a rodent. But uh, so tit mice are, they're really, they're really fun. If I put out a new feeder, um, and I wait for birds to get used to that new feeder. Almost 100% of the time, the first birds to understand how to use the new feeder will be the tit mice. I think they're just, they're just so smart and clever. And where the chickadee might come and get a seed and fly off to bang it, a lot of times I notice that my tit mice figure out a way, ah, oh, I don't have to go. Here's a hard part of this feeder I can bang it on. They just, they just seem like little, little um, sort of genius of, of birds, um, but a, a pretty, pretty little, little bird. And they are here year round also. And then I always associate with this group, um, our Carolina wrens. They're the most common wren that, that we have here, reddish brown above. Um, and the thing about the Carolina wrens, when it becomes nesting season, they will find the oddest place to put, um, put their, little, their little nests. And so this was a story of um, a picture of an, a nest that the Carolina wren built inside the side of a truck. And so what the family decided is that they wouldn't use the truck until the birds had left the nest. Um, it, they, they will pick the funniest little places. Uh, if you have hanging plants, they will end up nesting in those hanging plants. And I had one in a geranium that was on my deck and I, um, I ended up um, putting in devices to try to water the roots of the plant because I didn't want the plant to die because it was giving shelters of the bird, but I didn't want to flood the nest. So I, I got little sticks to be able to do a feeding system to keep the plant going while the, while the wrens um, were able to use it. And it was just delightful watching them come and go. Um, and then I actually did get to see the little ones take their first flight out of the nest. They also, um, some smaller birds will do this. They build several different nests and then um, decide which one uh, is the most appropriate. And their call. Some people say it sounds like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. Um, and that's the thing, the descriptions sometimes in the books on the calls are not what I think of when I hear it. And that's why listening to them, it really can be helpful. So before I move on, I'm going to ask uh, Gabe again to talk about um, the birds that we just covered. And there are other wrens in the area. This is just the most common one. I just have two facts I'd like to share. Um, the, going back to the red-breasted nuthatch, uh, this year is another eruption year for them. They're like the black-capped chickadee in that they're, when, they're, when the food runs out up north, they'll come down south and they'll come to a lot of feeders, but they hang out in the areas that have a lot of pine trees since they eat on pine nuts. And then some interesting behavior that I've noted is that white-breasted nuthatches, they'll take a seed from your feeder and then they'll go and they'll stash it in a tree. So that they can come back to it later, or they'll lodge their the seed, they'll lodge the seed in the bark and then hack away at it, kind of like a chickadee would hold the seed with its hands with, with its uh, feet, um, but instead it uses the bark. But the titmice and chickadees have actually learned that the nuthatches will do this, and so the chickadees and nuthatches will follow. Well, the chickadees and titmice will um, follow around the nuthatches and then steal their seeds whenever they're not looking. And so the nuthatch will leave and come back and then be like, hey, wait, where's my seed? And go get another one and bring it back. And then the chickadees and titmice will steal it again. 
So nuthatches actually seem a little stupid compared to titmice and chickadees, but they're actually quite smart. Sharon, can you play the sound of that nuthatch? Um, I don't have the red breasted one, but I have the I have the white breasted. Sort of like, <laughs> and you can hear them like when I'm hiking. A lot of times, I hear the nut hatches, the white breasted ones, before I see them because I just it's it's like the <laughs> other other thoughts on these birds, Gabriel. No, you covered most of it. We, I want to talk about our red birds now, and you know this is a library, so we're we're going to um, we're going to talk about a um, uh, little bit of poetry just to tie it into library. So, red, I think red birds are somewhat magical. This is a quote from Mary Oliver, the poet. Red bird came all winter, firing up the landscape as nothing else could. Uh, when a cardinal appears in your yard, it's a visitor from heaven. It's a traditional saying. And the Native um, Americans, the first people, believed a cardinal symbolized romance. To see it or dream about a red cardinal is usually a good omen. So if you're thinking red cardinals, think romance. So our northern cardinal uh, is our state bird, and everybody's familiar with them. The red uh, males are beautiful. They have their red coloring and their black face, and they're particularly beautiful in the snow. I happen to love the female cardinals because I think their beauty is much more subtle, and you have to you have to watch them to really ob observe and see that. Like if you look at the picture on the right, there's a lot of red in her crown and on her chest and she's just a really beautiful bird. You know, I, I, you know, the male's showy, but the female I think is subtly beautiful. And uh, if you have baby cardinals, they will all start out looking sort of drab um, and the one way to know it's an immature one is that it's beak um, they get the the beaks turn different colors later um, as they start to mature and so if particularly the baby boys will look really funny for a while while they're shedding their their baby feathers and getting the red look and also the the black mass comes in later on the immature birds um, and this year I had, um, I had cardinal babies as early as I think um, early April. They, I think this year our cardinals around the house might have had um, two, two to four clutches because I kept every, every month there was another group of, of, of baby birds. Um, and sometimes what will happen with, with the cardinals is that um, daddy will take care of the young birds as they're, they're first flying around and mom's sitting on, on the next one. They're, they're, pretty, um, pr they're pretty productive um, little birds. And the cardinals have a number of different calls. So it's a combination of almost like a whistle and a choo-choo-choo or, you know, different calls. But if you really watch your feeders, um, I, we always call it cardinal time. They will feed late in the day. And I sort of, you sort of start to say, well, why do they come out, particularly the, the males later in the day um, and probably early in the morning if I was if I was up at dusk, um, which I should be for birding. 
But um, at the end of the day, the cardinals come and the only thing I can think of is that it's for predator safety is that as the light comes down a little bit, you know, the, the boys are so red and flashy, they, they are um, a, a good target, but they will, they will feed um, almost when it's um, dark outside at the end of the day. And sometimes I'll look in my cedar tree and there'll be, uh, there'll be 20 cardinals, uh, males and females, all getting that last bite to eat because they have to fuel up for overnight. But yeah, cardinals are, are just, they're beautiful. So the other bird that we see in the winter that we may not see and never, I never see them um, in the summer are the dark eyed um, juncos. And every time I see them on my deck, if they come in big numbers, I say, hmm, is it going to snow tonight? Because they tend to, um, they tend to know when it's going to snow. And they also are, are great at, um, after a snowy day, you, you'll see them on the ground uh, feeding, particularly if you, if you throw some seeds out. They are um, year round here, but they are usually up in the, the mountains during, during the summertime. Uh, they just come down here um, this time of year. And the thing about the Joncos too, is that you're going to see a lot of different variety of coloration in the gray areas. Some of them are quite light and some of them almost look more towards the black end. Um, but they really are pretty. This picture was taken at Easton Park. Um, that's one of the, the fence posts there. And they're... Their song is pretty, um, pretty... I haven't heard them singing all that much. And some birds don't vocalize as much in the winter as they do in the spring. Um, like for example, the... The chickadee has a love song, I call it. It's Fabi, Fabe. And they'll start singing it even, you know, on the gloomiest day in early March, you start to hear the, the chickadee love song. So, but these are these these are really pretty, pretty, pretty birds. And usually they're in flocks. Usually if you see one, they've got a bunch of buddies somewhere nearby. So We have year round gold finches. A lot of people don't realize that they have gold finches feeding at their winter feeders. They look more like the bird on the right. Um, they're one of the birds that will totally change between their, their summer plumage and their winter plumage. And I love watching them when they are starting to change over uh, in the springtime. Uh, a lot of times you'll see them, they'll, they'll look partially like the bird on the right, and then they start to look like the, the black starts coming in. And sometimes I wonder if they saw themselves in the mirror, what would they think? Would they recognize themselves? Would they know that, that they change this dramatically from, from winter to spring? Uh, but you, you'll find them, their natural food is they, they, um, they eat the, the seeds of the thistle and because they're thistle eaters, um, that's their, their preferred food. And at your feeders, they'll eat niger, but they'll also eat uh, sunflower seeds. If you can hear that in the background, it's my 11 o'clock, which is a little early, nuthatch bird on my clock. So that was a nuthatch. Uh, but the uh, goldfinches, because they eat thistle, a lot of times they delay their breeding until the th thistle flowers seed. And if you know from our native flowers, those are, those are a little bit later in, in the year. Uh, so they time their breeding based on when it's gonna be optimal for the flowers. But you, you probably have finches um, at your feeders now. Um, again, if you see them in the winter, they will come back in, in the summer and, and feed. So, and their call. Their, 
they're called sort of a little chattery sound. Um, the one way when they're flying that I identify goldfinches from other flocks, and they usually are, again, if you see one, you probably will see a few, they, they tend to be in flocks. But when they fly, they fly in a, a little swooping pattern. They don't fly straight. They, they fly up and down, like almost in waves instead of in a straight line. And some people say that flight is to um, help protect them from predation. One of the birds that um, if you frequent the, the Arboretum at, at Blandy, uh, you will see mockingbirds. Uh, the, especially this time of year, I was there uh, last weekend and I was watching the mockingbirds in a grass area, I was lying on my belly watching them and they were doing this, they were, they were displaying their wings out, um, either a territorial or somebody, uh, one theory we read was that it might be to scare the insects up. Um, so they, they have a, a particular fun little dance that they do. Um, mockingbirds are mockers um, and that's where their name comes from many tongued mimic. The Hopis and Pueblos believe that they were the, the, that mockingbirds first taught people how to speak. So in that belief, you can, if you can speak today, you can thank a mockingbird. In the summer, they will sing at night. If you keep your windows open and you have a mockingbird, um, be prepared, particularly the lonely ones that haven't found a mate. They will, they will sing and sing and sing. And mockingbirds have been known not only to mock other bird songs, but also um, human sounds like a, a horn alarm or different types of things. Um, I have been out looking for a bird and thinking, what? how could that bird be here? Only to turn and find that it was a mockingbird on, on the, on the uh, trail. So mockingbirds, again, it's hard to identify them by the song other than the number of times they repeat the same thing. Um, we have other mimics that come only in the summer. Um, we have brown thrashers, but their calls are a little bit um, less repeating and a little bit more sort of, sort of crazy. We have also, um, we also have some other mimics that will come in, in summertime. Uh, we have a catbird that will be here in the in the summer. They tend to leave for the winter, but the catbird call has its own call. It has it does have a meowing sound, and then it will um, it its notes are not as clear. Um, the mockingbirds can really do good imitations of of other birds. Okay, before I get on to our bluebirds that we have. Um, any comments, questions about the birds that we've covered? Gabrielle, would you add anything to what we've covered? Um, one helpful tip on identifying winter goldfinches, since they are very different from their summer plumage, one thing that I noticed that stays the same with them is their wings. They, are, they have black wings with white wing bars. So a really helpful tip is if you see this small, dullish brown bird at one of your feeders, especially a Niger feeder, if it has those black and white wing patterns, it, it's almost definitely a winter goldfinch. So the other thing sometimes um, is that we get other finches there and um, they look in terms of size a lot like a pine siskin. Um, Anything that you would say in, in identifying pine siskins, I don't even, I don't think I even have a picture of one in this presentation, but anything you'd add, Gabe? If, if anyone knows what a female house finch looks like, a pine siskin looks like a smaller version of that with a thinner and very spiky bill. And it also has some yellow tinges in its wing feathers. 
but it's about the size of a goldfinch. Okay. Um, the other thing that I always love, I'm always thrilled when I see a bluebird. I, I really do believe there's something about the bluebird of, of happiness. Um, so bluebirds are here year round. The only time I ever see bluebirds at my feeding stations is when we get a hard frost on, on the ponds and the rivers and they'll come in for water. Um, they love to be in, in fields, open fields um, that are close to woodlands. Um, the other bluebirds that I have here, you, you won't usually see them in the winter. So we also get visited by indigo buntings, which is the, the bluebird on the, um, that's a male indigo bunting sitting on a sunflower. And they're one of the last birds that, that tend to migrate here. I usually see them starting in May. And tree swallows, which um, again, they, they've already migrated away. But what will happen is if you have a, a bluebird trail, you'll see the tree swallows and bluebirds um, using the same boxes. And now the, the theory is that if you put um, two boxes together, if you've noticed the boxes at, at Blandy or at, at the park, um, Shenandoah River Park, these two boxes together, because what will happen is the tree swallows are very territorial and they don't want another tree swallow family living next to them, but they'll allow the bluebirds in. So that is sort of a natural helping relationship between the two birds. Uh, the bluebird that that is on the left, um, that might have even been taken at Easton Park. We I on occasion see the bluebird there, um, but you know also at. Um, the Shenandoah River Park where there is a bluebird trail um, and also at Blandy. And I, what I do is I will, I will wait at a bluebird box uh, far enough away not to disturb the parents. And I love to watch them come in um, and land to do their feeding. I've also been there when the tree swallow babies are ready to go and the parents are trying to get them out of the box. It's just really fun to watch of all the interaction and they'll they'll fly and pretend they're bringing food in and then they don't bring food in and then the babies get really mad and it's just really a fun thing to to watch in terms of the the interactions. Um, so those are some of our our we're lucky to have the bluebirds that we have. I'll play their song. Their song is not. Um... So it's a, a pretty simple song. Um, there's another song that I hear when I'm walking in the in in along the edge of a, of woods, but you know, again, if you just go and watch the bluebirds near um, near their boxes just to watch how hard those parents work and feeding them and watch the interaction with the parents. A lot of times one parent will sit and guard while the other ones go in. Um, it's just, they're amazing to watch that, that interaction. Uh, sparrows, we have lots of different sparrows. I've just highlighted three of them um, and to show the difference. Uh, chipping sparrows. Um, Gabe, are you seeing any chip chipping sparrows this time of year or have they all gone? Uh, for the most part, chipping sparrows have flown the coop, if you know what I mean. Um, some will yes. stick around in the winter, but generally they're all gone right now. And during the summer, uh, they will um, come visit me. They tend not to go to the feeders, but they tend to, if you put seeds um, out, they tend to eat seeds off the ground. Um, they're really, to me, really pretty. And um, this picture, I don't, I, I'll have to have a goal of a, 
of getting another um, different chipping sparrow uh, picture because they're just they're they're really a pretty tiny little bird and notably um, they have the really pretty russet rusty crown and a little um, stripe that goes through their eye and. And they make a very shrill little call. Um, and sometimes it, that confuses me with a pine wobbler. It almost sounds like if you're familiar with, with the sounds and songs of wobblers, um, the chipping sparrow reminds me of that. Uh, on the right-hand side is a white-throated sp uh, sparrow and And pe people say the song sounds like Sam Peabody, Sam Peabody, or Oh Canada. Different people describe it different ways. And I tend to see the white-throated uh, sparrows this time of year, and then they, they migrate out. And sometimes if you're listening to the different songs, some of them... I, sound like they're they're practicing sometimes like a sam will come out without a peabody or and i sometimes think that might be the younger ones getting getting their songs ready for when they they migrate and the the bottom one is um, a song sparrow and we have those year round And the way that I identify the song sparrow is usually with sparrows, the, the most important thing to look at besides their head markings are their chests. And you can see the difference of these three sparrows. You've got one with um, sort of a, a grayish chest, um, another one that, that has a little bit of white coming up the belly. But look at the song sparrow. You've got striping and then a, a dot. Um, and look under the chin. You sort of um, if you look under the chin of the song sparrow, it looks like one of those old fashioned guys with the, with the funny sideburns coming down on, on either side. Um, so those are some of the ways to identify sparrows. We also, if, if you go to um, the Arboretum or the State Park, there's, um, a, and around my property, we get field sparrows in in the summer and their song is really beautiful and, and just sounds a little bit like a flute to me. Um, before Gabe needs to go to work, unfortunately, um, but before you leave Gabe, anything on sparrows that you would add? Um, we could be here all day on identifying sparrows, but with these three, you pointed out that it's, it's important to look at the breast, which is very true. Um, song sparrows, generally, they'll, uh, they have streaked breasts like this, but another good feature is this central spot on their breast. Um, how, a good, easy feature for white-throated sparrows is their, uh, the, there's these yellow spots right in front of their eyes. Sometimes white-throated sparrows will have brown instead of the white on top of their head, but they'll always have the yellow. So that'll help you with uh, identifying white-throated sparrows in addition to their always white throat. Chipping sparrows will have uh, the rusty cap. In their winter plumage, they look a bit drabber than their summer plumage, like as shown in the photo. Um, they'll have a lot more brown on the sides of their head, um, but they'll always have the rusty cap, but there are many other sparrows that we can see, but these are generally the three that you're going to see at your feeder. Um, we, we have morning doves that, that come um, to my feeders. And the thing about our morning doves is that I think they breed all year round. They may take a month off, but yes, I have a, an abundance of, of morning doves. And, but 
but I, I love watching them. I love this picture because of the little attitude that they, they both have. Um, the males will really puff up their chest to display to the females. Um, and they're really interesting. They, they store their, their seeds in the crop, which is um, an area right under their throat. And a lot of birds, like birds of prey that have um, big crops, you'll even see them on the babies poking out that, that they fill up. But what you, the doves will do is instead of like the chickadees that are taking one seed, eating it at a time and being nice about it, is the doves will come to your, your feeders, they'll fill up with the seeds, they'll keep it up in their crop, which is up in their throat. And when they're filled up and safe, they go somewhere else to digest. Um, but yeah, these are morning doves and they get their name because of their, their, sad, their sad call. And some people have, have thought that when you hear a morning dove, some people even think that they're owls the way they call. So, so finches, um, just a couple of things on, on finches. We've got house finches, which are, are an introduced bird. Um, and we have purple finches. And the way that I tend to separate them is that the purple finch, some people say that their chest looks like they were drinking wine and it spilled on them, that they look more dipped. The um, house finches tend to be more streaked on their chest, if you look at the one on the, on the left-hand side. Um, so those are two ways of telling um, the finches apart. And as Gabriel said before, that we also are getting pine um, siskins down from the hills, and they look like the female finches. These are both male finches. Woodpeckers, um, and it's interesting because even though I have a flicker, technically they're not considered a, a woodpecker. And if you look in the in the books, but we have great woodpeckers in in this area. A winter visitor uh, that will visit your suet feeders is a sapsucker, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And the one that I'm showing on the left here is a female. If this had been her partner or a boy, the area under the, the bill uh, before the black area would be all red. Um, and they have a yellow wash on their body. Um, but they're really, I, they're really a pretty bird. And if you're hiking in the forest and you see a tree that has tiny holes all around its circumference in bands, it's a sapsucker that made those holes. But they will, they will come um, to suet feeders in, in the winter. Uh, on the right are um, a yellow shafted flickers. And in the winter, they'll come to feeders. Um, their way that their feet are is they prefer to be ground feeders. So you tend to more see them on the ground. I only get them um, in the winter on on my, my suet feeders. And, and sometimes if the day isn't too cold, they're ground feeding. And they're called yellow shafted because when they fly, they have this beautiful yellow on the bottom of their wings. This is a, a male and female. The one on the tree is the male. He's got a mustache that's coming down. And if you look at the one on the right, there's no mustache, that's the female. And this is a nest that, that they had in the neighborhood. And they have little tiny nice polka dots all over their chest. Other um, woodpeckers, and I have had every one of these at my feeders at different times. Very rarely the redheaded in the middle, um, but the ones on the left are red bellied and the reason they're called red bellied is if you look at the bottom picture you can see a little bit of red on that um, female bird um, right near her, her feet. Um, some people have 
called them, um, there was a guy who was feeding birds at Easton Park and he said, how about those red hooded um, woodpeckers? But yes, they have red on their head, but they're called red bellied. And a lot of times, unless you really study them near, their, near your feeders, you won't see that little red wash area. Uh, the one on the top is a, is a male because the red goes all the way down to where the beak is. The one on the bottom is a female and she's got a little red dot on where the beak is, but her red stops at the top of the head and she'll have a little gap of feathers. Uh, and we get them year round um, and they nest here and, and the young will have no red on their head at all. And then you'll start to see the red coming through. The woodpeckers in the middle are one of the most beautiful woodpeckers I think that, that we have here. It's red-headed woodpecker. And the um, males and females look identical. Um, so the only time you see a red-headed woodpecker that looks different is on the bottom picture and it's a juvenile. So the juveniles are brownish, grayish, um, and then they get their adult feathering in and they look like they are just ready to go out um, with their tuxedos on and their, their, red, um, their red masks. They're, they're just beautiful. They are not common at feeders. What they do is that during the, the fall is they will do caches in trees. They'll collect acorns and different food and they'll either put them in hollow areas of the tree or they'll put them actually along the, the bark of the tree. And um, I've seen them where they, they, once they have a cache, they really don't like the red bellies or the pileated coming near their cache because they invested a lot in gathering up food for the winter. The best place to see red-headed woodpeckers uh, other than Maggie's backyard or um, along the a road that we have here. Um, we've got some nesting ones, although I'm not seeing them this winter. So I'm a little worried about where they, where they may be spending the winter. But um, Sky Meadows Park, um, if you go into the park, instead of going up to where the mansion is, if you take the first turn as you're coming in, there's a right-hand turn up to a picnic area where the uh, master naturalists also have a wonderful sensory trail. Um, the red-headed woodpeckers are pretty reliable in there if you hike in into the woods and, um, and just, just stay in the woods, you'll hear them drumming and then you'll start seeing them flying around there. But um, it's, a, it's a great place to see red-headed woodpeckers. And then our big bird, uh, woodpecker, which a lot of people have called um, like our, our woody woodpecker is our pileated woodpeckers. And they will come into your feeders if you have a suet feeder that is big enough to um, support their bodies. Um, this example is um, a boy because he's got a, a red area if you can see it on the slide. He has a red that goes uh, like a mustache up to his, his beak. And they are, they are just beautiful. And they will call to each other. They, they will roost in, they have holes at night that they'll go in and, and roost in the trees at night. Um, and they drum to each other. Some of the drumming is for insects, but some of the drumming is territorial. And some of the drumming you hear, they'll, they'll find a hollow log and the drumming is just spectacular, that's about mating. And I don't know, G Gabe, are you still with us? No. He had unfortunately had to go to work. So those are our, our woodpeckers and, and I'll talk about suet feeding. A um, Couple of other woodpeckers that we have here are downy and hairy woodpeckers. And both of these are, are females, um, but it's a really great picture that I was able to find um, and credit this person from the internet um, that Downey and Harry look almost identical other than size. And sometimes the sizes even overlap a little bit. And the difference, if you see the arrow pointing out between the Downey on the left and the Harry on the right besides 
size is there's a little tiny bit of black that comes down their shoulder onto their, their chest. Um, so those are the difference. And so I got curious, well, why do Downies and Harry's look alike? Because when I looked them up, they are not in the same, um, they are not in the same family. Their DNA is different, but they look almost identical. They almost look like um, a baby bird. And that's one thing about birds is that Birds, once they are able to fly and leave the nest, they're the same size as adults. So if you see a little bird with a big bird, um, for the other than ducks, uh, when you see one that, that is um, coming out of a nest, it will be full size. It's, if you think it's a baby, it may be a different species. So I, I started getting curious about why are Harry and Downies, why do they look alike? but they're such different sizes. And um, what they thought is their genetic um, lineages split almost 6 million years ago. And so the theory is that the downy mimics the hairy because if a predator bird's coming, they may get confused and think it's a bigger bird. So it might've evolved for protection is why they mimic each other. Almost like in butterflies, why the butterflies have these mimic sort of eyes on the back is all predator control. So uh, just sort of fascinating. And just an aside, if you see the, um, the downy on the left-hand side, that's one of the ways that I hang my suet feeders that don't have a place for the bigger birds to rest is that I find um, an old log and I hang my suet feeder against the log and it does a couple of things. The birds like it, they feel better. They'll fly in at the bottom and then they'll sort of walk up the log. And then you can see that they use their, their tail feathers to prop themselves up um, while, they're, while they're eating the suet. The other thing is it's great for photography because a number of my pictures that look like birds on trees are just before they walk up um, the entire log. So um, just a little bit about our Heeries and our downy woodpeckers. So I wanna transition into some of the birds of prey that we have in the area, because we also have wonderful um, birds of prey. And one of the birds that you can commonly see here is a red-shouldered hawk. And if you notice the red-shouldered, it's called red-shouldered because when it's in flight, you can see a little bit of red on what would be its shoulders. The other way I identify a red-shouldered hawk is when you're looking through it, sometimes the wings almost look transparent on the bottom or they're what we call windows. Um, but the other thing is when I try to identify it, if it's sitting, look at its chest. Its chest is mostly red streaked. So this is a common bird. Um, they are nesting, there's a nesting pier at the Arboretum. And so a lot of times if you spend any time at the State Arboretum, you're going to see um, a red-shouldered hawk. We also have, um, we live along the Shenandoah River um, just south of town, and there's a nesting piers along here too. Um, they're, they're really a a pretty bird. And what red shoulder hawks eat uh, is a lot of times you'll see them near um, a wet or marshy area because their favorite foods are snakes, um, amphibians, frogs. They will eat other birds, other small birds. They'll eat little mice. They eat a lot of different, a lot of different um, things, but they, I've seen them fly into a nest with a huge snake. Um, they're really, they're really fantastic hunters. So compare now um, our red-shouldered hawk. The other hawk that you tend to see here a lot is a red-tail hawk. And the red-tail hawk, when they're sitting, they're a little bit bigger than the red-shouldered hawks, but sometimes size is hard to tell. The best way of identifying a red-shouldered versus a, a red-tail hawk when they're sitting is the, what I call the belly band. So notice the belly of the red-tail hawk compared to the red-shouldered that had much more coloration all the way down towards, towards its feet. Um, this red-tail hawk has 
a belly, what I call a belly band. The young um, sometimes don't have their full color on their tail feathers. Um, if you get them in the right light when they're flying, you can see the red tail through the through the through looking up through the, the right light. Um, the picture of the red tailed hawk with the squirrel was one that I, I took at Eastern Park. It just swooped down and there was one less squirrel. Um, and in if you look closely at him eating that squirrel um, or her, you can see the talons that they have. They hunt mostly with, with swooping down with their talons. The other thing about our hawks and all, most of our birds of prey is that the males and females um, are, are sized differently. Females tend to be a little bit bigger in birds of prey than their um, partner males. And the reason is that the females have a little bit more body mass to be able to sit on nests because a lot of our hawks um, and birds of prey like eagles, they start nesting in the winter months and the females need a little bit more body warmth to be able to do their job, which is primarily the incubation. Both birds will incubate, but the females do the majority part. So what happened is they've evolved so that females are better for warmth and incubation. Males are a little bit more streamlined to be able to do better hunting. Two other hawks um, that you will see commonly, um, more commonly the sharp shinned and Cooper's hawks. And um, I have, um, I have two sharp shin hawks that have found my yard. Um, and even this morning there was one sitting out there. And the way you know that um, it's a sharp shin hawk is they're, they're smaller than the red shouldered and the, um, and the red tails. They're, they're more compact in their bodies. They're more specialist to take out. Their favorite prey is other small songbirds. Um, and they can catch birds in flight. They are incredible flyers. They're, they're, um, they're not quite like a falcon, but the other day one swooped by and flew right through my deck and it was pretty, a pretty rapid flight. <clears throat> so the difference, they look very, very similar, um, particularly if you're in the field, um, they, they can almost overlap in size, but the average size of a sharp shin hawk is 12.5 inches. And that's from head to the end of the teal. When you look at these different dimensions in the book, it's, it's head to teal. And the Cooper's hawks are, are 16.5. But the other thing is if you can see the face, the eyes on the sharp shin hawk tend to be a little bit closer to, to their, their beak. So those are a couple, and they will take birds. Um, there's always a dilemma when you're feeding birds, you're creating opportunities for your shoptions and your cooper hawks to come to, your, to the buffet. <clears throat> We're really lucky. We, the number of bald eagles that have um, started nesting in Virginia, when I first started um, doing work with bald eagles, um, there were so few nests. And now um, the number of nests have, have really increased. Um, we have a nesting pier um, right on the Shenandoah River, just um, in close to um, Eastern Park on the other side of the bridge. Um, there are nesting piers all along the, the Shenandoah now. And so we're, we're really fortunate. Again, um, male and female, the, there's, a, there's, to me, when you see them sitting together, there's a noticeable size difference. Um, the female, the bald eagles do their mating now and um, they, will, they will start sitting on nests. There's wonderful nest cams that you can um, get through Cornell. Uh, the immature bald eagles, um, there's a picture of one down on the right. I, I really like immatures. I think they're really beautiful. Sometimes they get confused and people say, I saw a golden eagle. We do get golden eagles through here, but um, most of the time, if you do see an eagle and you and it looks 
brownish, it's probably a young bird. It takes four to five years for the young to develop the white head and the white tail and be mature to be able to breed. Um, and the young birds, if you look at them, uh, their first set of feathers, they tend to be a little bit um, broader for, to help with, with flight. Um, at the place to, you can see eagles um, usually regularly is at Cool Spring, um, Shenandoah University, their, their little area, there's an eagle's nest that's sometimes visible. Um, but they are they are awesome awesome birds, and we're lucky to have them have them back. Also, notice the difference between the immature's um, beak and the mature, uh, and also the eye colors on some ma mature birds can change. We also have um, helper vultures that um, do cleanup. I I call them um, the cleanup specialists. And we have two type. One is um, the, with the red head is called a turkey vulture. And the one on the right hand side is sitting on the chimney at, at, at the State Arboretum. That's a black vulture. In flight, um, the, the turkey vultures, if you look at the, the picture on the right, um, that's really showing their white under, under wings. Um, when you see a turkey vulture flying in the air, they tend to, their, their wings tend to have a, what we call a dihedral or a V shape. They tend to be up in a V. And when they fly, they, they tend to rock back and forth a, a little bit. The black vultures are much um, flatter in their flight. And instead of having the white underneath like a shawl, I, I say they have like little white gloves on the tips of their their wings and at a very far distance if they're up high sometimes you can get fooled and think that you have an eagle and it's it really is a vulture and for sure if you go to the arboretum you can see lots of lots of, of vultures we're really lucky because we have a number of different owls um, in the area the owl that you will probably hear the most, and if you're lucky, see, is the barred owl, which is on the left-hand side. Um, and on the right-hand side, there was a great horned owl's nest at the Arboretum. Um, and this is taken from a very far distance with uh, an extender on my camera and heavily cropped. Um, I really, I really, respect and keep a distance from any, any bird's nest. The last thing I wanna do is, is interrupt um, their raising their young. Uh, the actual, um, the horns on the owl, their ears are not there, their ears are down lower. Uh, they, do, um, they do use eyesight and also hearing owls for, for being able to um, find their prey. We do have some smaller owls, but they're, they're even more difficult to locate and, and see. Along the river and also um, at the State Arboretum and particularly at Cool Spring, Shenandoah um, University campus, uh, there are great blue herons and there are quite a few heron rookeries that we have. We've got some in front royal that are um, further up, um, up the river from um, the state park that if you do a, a, bird, a float on the river, you'll see the rookery. But what's really exciting is um, at Cool Spring in March, you'll start to see the herons um, on, the, on the nests. And herons are solitary birds usually. They don't like each other very much um, during non-breeding times. But when they go to breed, they breed in, in colonies um, or rookeries and because there's safety in numbers. And one of the easiest rookeries to see is at Cool Spring. And it's really fun to watch them coming in with the, they have giant sticks in their mouth to build their nests. 
And then as they start to raise their young, you can see them bringing, bringing food in for their young. We also on occasion will get um, the white egrets here. Um, they're usually migratory. We, I saw some um, early spring and also um, at the, at just as winter was coming, they were migrating through. They, they tend not to stay here. But if you go to the Eastern shore, you definitely will see lots of herons, lots of um, egrets. The white ones are egrets. The gray slaty ones are herons. And some people have told me when I've been out, um, look at the crane. I've been at Eastern Park and they'll say, yes, we have cranes here. Um, they're, they're like cranes, but if you've ever seen a, a whooping crane, um, they're, they're, a lot, they're a lot bigger. Um, but yes, they're, they're really beautiful birds. So that's um, a little bit on identifications of birds in the area. I'm, I'm going to stop a little bit and see if there's any questions on identification. And I want to talk about backyard bird feeding in the time that we have, have left. So any questions? I see everybody's been chatting with, um, with different ones. So I had a question, why do birds mimic? Um, they use their mimicry, it's thought to attract mates. I don't know what the evolutionary reason that they mimic, but, um, and it's really interesting because people have done experiments with bird songs to see if they could change a bird song if there was a baby and it wasn't around its parents. But I'll have to I'll have to look up why mimicking. Um, but I do know that the better the mimic, uh, the more likely they will have a mate. You know, birds do all these different things in mating to decide um, to decide who's a fit mate. Sometimes it's the brightness of the male's color. Sometimes um, it's the it's the dance. If if you've been to to some of the more tropical areas in Costa Rica, you've got the lek birds that do their little dance. Some of it is, can you build me a good house? Um, in other birds, it's vocalization, and so that's what I think um, that the mimic is. Um, so I'm just I'm just going through, and I will. I will get um, I will get get um, information to everybody on different sites to be able to see birds. I have that coming up. So I just want to talk a little bit about bird conservation. Uh, this is a study from last year that our migratory birds um, are really decreasing. Um, 90% of the losses come from just 12 families, sparrows, blackbirds, wobblers, and finches. Um, and it, we love birds. We don't want to see birds not in our environment. And a lot of it is because of um, it's it's because of land use. Um, it is global uh, weather changing, but land use is is number one. When we take habitat away, uh, there's no places for for birds. So some things that you can do as an individual, um, that there's some simple actions that really do help birds. The other mortality for, for birds is from um, things like striking your windows, um, also from, um, from house cats. There's a lot of predation of, of house cats. So some of, the things, some of the things that you can do as an individual is to, is to be able to um, keep, keep your cats indoors, make your windows safer, and I'm gonna show you some things. Reduce um, lawn areas by planting native species and flowers. Um, a lot of the birds' um, eating habits have evolved over time and they're very specialized. There are some hummingbirds uh, in South America that only feed on one type of flower. And if you lose that flower, you lose the bird. Avoid pesticides. There are ways of dealing with um, your lawns without needing to apply pesticides. In fact, um, I just urge everyone to call 
your local electric company and ask for a do not um, do not apply herbicides, and they will come out and post them on on. They will post them on your, your utility poles. All of my utility poles have a little butterfly symbol and it says um, no herbicides on it. Um, all you have to do is call them, give them your property, and they will, they will honor the no, no herbicides. Also, the type of coffee that you drink. If you drink shade coffee, it's better for birds when people um, do planting of coffee fields, they take natural habitat from birds. And our birds that, that are here in the summer need a place to go um, in the winter. Um, plastics are really deadly for birds that, are, that use um, wildlife areas. Um, and other things, um, traps for, I, I'm seeing a lot of suggestions in, in the traps and, and in the chat and that's great. So anything like mouse traps, rat traps, um, any sticky chat traps are really bad for birds of prey. And also birds of prey that eat um, birds uh, are rodents that have been killed by pesticides or by toxic poisons can be affected. A uh, lead shot is terrible for um, birds that eat, um, eat in, in our aquatic areas. So um, if you can start to urge your legislation to um, honor no lead, lead fowl. And if you think about it, um, it's, it's really important. Netting is real, also netting outside. Birds can get caught in netting. So making, making glass safe for birds, um, there, is, um, there is a way, if you see here, um, I'm not gonna go into it really long because I know I'm going um, longer than, than some people expected in the presentation, but I urge you to go to the site www.birdsavers.com. They sell devices for the windows, but they also have do-it-yourself devices just to break up the patterns so that birds do not strike your, your windows. If you get a bird that strikes your window, um, all you need to do is to, um, is to first watch it and you know if it strikes and it's not in an area where there's a predator I just leave it on the ground and I've had some birds that it takes even 30 minutes for it to recover from having hit something and I just watch it and because the best thing to do is not to handle the bird right away and to see if it can recover on on its own. The same thing with baby birds falling out of nests is that a lot of birds will fledge out in nests before they can fly, but their their parents will find them and feed them, feed them on the on the ground. So you know, just when you see a bird on the ground, don't immediately think it needs to be rehabilitated. Um, creating back. Yard habitats, um, the National Wildlife Federation has great resources on, find, on how to set up your, your backyards for habitat. So native, native plants and, and feeders are great for birds. Um, leaving some type of sheltering, whether it's a pile of wood, you don't have to make your, your yards tidy. The more tidy and perfect your yards look, the worse they are for wildlife. And so um, that's, I, I take pride in my untidy yard. <laughs> um, but you need, birds need shelter. They need places to hide from predators. And so if, you know, leave some wood piles. Um, they're great for, for birds. There's some places at the State Arboretum in, in, at Blandy that are just these thickets of raspberries and things down by Lake Arnold. And when I walk by, there could be 50 birds in there. They just, they love thickets. Um, water is really essential. And I have, um, I have a very shallow um, old Pyrex baking dish with a heater in it. And the birds, when everything else freezes, they come and, and they'll even bathe on those days. So water is, is really, really important. And then uh, there's no reason if, if a tree's not going to um, come down and be a safety hazard, 
leave old trees. The reason that we were losing our, our red-headed woodpeckers is because they, they didn't have places to, um, they didn't have places to be able to raise their young. And if you look at the tree this red-headed woodpecker picked, it has no bark on it. And a lot of woodpeckers will pick a tree with no bark on it because if it has bark, then snakes can come up it much more easily. And so if you see these old trees, they're great, they're habitat. Um, long as, long as there's, um, long as there's, there's a, a place for, for it to fall if, if the tree does fall. This tree with the red-headed woodpecker also had a flicker nest in it. It had, it was an apartment. <laughs> so feeding birds, locate your birds in a safe place that they can get shelter. Um, it's important to feed your, your, your feeder, to clean your feeders, um, to get the wet clumps of old seed out because they can have rot in it and it can get mold and that's not good for birds. Um, clean, if you have platform feeders, get the, the old um, hulls out and clean your trays. And um, disinfect your feeders by scrubbing them in a weak uh, beach bleach solution, uh, a quarter of a cup to two gallons or 10%. And the reason to do this, I have two sets of feeders now. So I have a set of feeders that is in the house. And today I will go in and replace my um, finch feeders is there's a, a, a disease that affects finch's eyes. And when they put their heads in the feeders to feed, uh, they can leave some of the disease and other birds can get it. So weekly I'm taking my feeders down I clean them in the bleach solution. I put the, the ones that have been in the house for a week back up. So, um, and wash your hands, keep your, keep your seed. If you start to see that your seed is not looking good, you need to replace it. So types of food, we got one um, question about types of food. The best site to go for types of food is feederwatch.org. And it has this really great, um, great thing where you can pick where you are, you can pick the food type and the type of feeder and it comes up and it shows you what birds will feed for those foods. Or you can click on a bird and it will show you what foods um, are best fed by, by the diff different birds. So you can see here, um, it will recommend common foods are black oiled sunflower seeds, not they, I only feed black oil I don't feed the striped. Uh, it's more expensive, but the birds like it better. I did, I was putting out some um, sunflower um, hearts or ha hulled sunflowers. Those are really costly and I need to keep the squirrels away from them. Safflower is the trick. If you want to feed birds and not have squirrels, Squirrels hate safflower and I've tried everything. I've tried putting pepper on my seeds. I've, I've done any, everything. I also give a place for the squirrels to eat away from the birds, but safflower does the trick. Niger is for um, seed that goldfinches like, and there are special Niger feeders that you can even, they'll even, goldfinches will hang upside down on a flower and feed. So you can get an upside down feeder and it, it, discourages other birds from eating the niger. Suet, um, I buy suet cakes. Um, I do have hot suet that has pepper in it and that does keep the squirrels from eating it. That, that's the one thing that does seem to work. One of the things I do with my suet is I put it in the freezer and it's easier to take it in and out of the, of the containers to be able to put outside for the birds. It's less messy. So those are some of the different types of things um, that I have. I have had every type of feeder imaginable that has been quote unquote squirrel proof. And I have not been able to discourage um, the, the, they, the squirrels have figured it out almost to the point of ones that are supposed to close when the squirrels get on them, they will hang on one side to counterbalance. I mean, you can't keep, you can't keep the squirrels away and there's plenty of there's plenty of websites and I won't do anything cruel to the squirrels although I do have a water gun when when they are like really being annoying 
so that's information on feeding, but you know, and you know, and and I do get conflicted when the hawks come through. Some people say if you don't want your your little birds to be predated at your feeders, uh, if you've had a hawk strike at them, bring them in for a few days and then put them back out. Um, you know, I just I. I, I just, everybody has to eat. That's the only thing I can think of. And our birds are really smart. If they see a shadow going overhead, they will freeze. They will not move. Um, sometimes it's interesting to see which is the first bird that will start to move after, after they've seen a hawk. And um, I've seen downy woodpeckers for 30 minutes just not move a muscle. And it's just they 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 know a hawk went over, and they also know that the hawks that movement will attract them to to the hawks. So some of the different places and um, and a a pitch for um, for Audubon is we are working on a new website and and um, anybody please you know join our local Audubon it's not expensive every it's twenty dollars a year and we are going to um, it, we're working on our new website we will put up um, links um, the information is wonderful we, we're going to have blogs and all sorts of things so um, we're we're modernizing we 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 um, we're going to get that information out. We also have a Facebook page, um, Audubon. And I'm gonna tell you about other places on, on how to find birds. Warren County, Shenandoah River State Park is great for birding any time of year. Um, Eastern Park, which is the, um, the, the greenway um, that the local tree stewards um, put together. Uh, it's a wonderful resource. And there's great birds always at Eastern Park because it is along it is along the Shenandoah River, Thompson Wildlife Management Area in Linden um, is one of the best places to go in the spring. The trillium are beautiful, but also just as the trillium are dying off, or just as the trillium are there, we get red starts, we get um, scarlet tanagers, um, towhees, wood thrushes that are like God's flute. Um, it is just a wonderful area. It is a wonderful area to um, to do birding, and sometimes I'm conflicted. Should I should I look at the flowers or should I look at the birds? And um, I'm always delighted when there's a there's a bird on a flower there. So that's a that's a great place in Linden. Um, in Clark County, um, Landy, the State Arboretum of Virginia, it's open year round. Um, it's great for birding. It's great for, um, they have a native um, plant trio. In February, they have um, flowers that bloom in the snow. Um, it's a great resource and their website will tell you um, what's blooming there. Shenandoah River, um, Shenandoah University River Campus at Cool Spring is a farmer golf course. And it's a little little hard. The road in is a little bumpy, but it's great trails, and they have um, great birding there. And in March, um, the Audubon will be doing a, a walk on the rookery and also um, the to see if we can find the eagle's nest there. But it's it's a it's a really nice place and really easy for being able to stroll and, and walk there. In Frederick County, Lake, lake Frederick is um, a public lake that is inside the um, senior living area there. Um, and it's, it, this year has been a little bit slow for waterfowls, but one, one year there were, <clears throat> um, there were like 200 tundra swans that, that landed. I'll wait until my um, finch stops on my clock. You'll notice that my clock's a little fast. Sometimes I commute. In also in Frederick County in Winchester, the third Winchester battlefield, and Abrams Creek Wetland Preserve is like a little gem. And uh, there's there's wetlands along there, and the Audubon um, in non-COVID times um, did did um, guided walks there. And there's a species list there. Uh, and 
also Sky Meadows State Park, which is um, on Route 50. There's, there's like three different habitats there that you can find birds, but that's where you can find definitely your red-headed woodpeckers and great other birds. So if you want to keep informed about birding, one of the best resources is um, ebird.org. And, um, and it can, you can go to the website. Uh, you can look at different species. The bird on the left is an albatross, so that's obviously not here. Uh, but if you type in the name of um, the county, the best thing to do is uh, when you get there and you do explore regions is type the county comma state and then you click on the county. The next thing you'll see is here's Warren County. You will see the most recent bird sightings that birders that do lists will put in. And if you click on a species it will bring up from Cornell a picture of that species so you can learn about it. But if you want to learn about where that bird is, you click on the date. And I'll show you that. So you can also change locations um, by clicking up here. And any location will tell you on the right hand side the top hot spots for birding and you can click on that. And the number is the number of species seen there. And then if you click on the date, you will then get, so that that's the trick. So, oh, there was a long-eared owl, um, which I haven't seen this year. Um, and if you click on it, it will the name of the bird, it will bring up a page about it. But if you click on the date, it will bring up where it was and what time it was seen. And then you can even click on Blandy Experimental Farm State Arboretum of Virginia and it will give you a map. And it will also give you all the other species seen on that day. So this is a great resource if I'm going out or if I'm trying to say, should I go to the Arboretum today? Should I go to Sky Meadow? Should I go to Shenandoah River Park? Sometimes I'll go and say, oh, I wonder who's seeing what where and when did they see it? And not only do you get the, you get observer notes and sometimes photographs. And so you see, here's uh, Gabriel Ricketts who joined us today, our, our expert birder. The other thing is there is a rare sightings list that you can sign up to, a listserv, and so, when those um, tundra swans landed on Lake Frederick, um, I got an email and so I, I knew to go and, and to see it. There's um, in Fairfax County, there's been, I think it's Fairfax County or maybe it's Montgomery County, there's been a male painted bunting, which is like one of the most beautiful birds in the world. And that went out on the rear bird list. So those are really helpful if you if you are wanting to to see um, a particular species. So again, we did this as, as a joint from our Northern Shenandoah Valley Audubon Society. Um, and um, the mission of, of our society is not only to preserve for birds, but you have to preserve um, and conservation and habitat because without habitat, we don't have birds. Um, also the Friends of, of Samuel Public Library. Um, we have a great amount of information in the chat and I can save that, um, but what I want to do is um, then open it up for, for questions and, and see. I know, as, as always, people who know my presentations, I, I know I've gone a long time, so I, I thank everybody for being here and hanging in as long as you have. Um, and. I, I do want to end by saying that the most important thing is to really take the time to observe birds and understand them and, and learn about them. And that just sparks a natural curiosity. It's, it's great for being able to then use it with, um, with, with kids 
getting them hooked into birds. You can learn science and all sorts of different things. And as we recover from, from our um, current situation, um, there's lots of different groups that, that offer bird outings. It's great to go with experienced people as people see different things. Um, we just completed in December, the, the Christmas count. There's a couple of ones that go. If you next December join a, um, the Christmas count, uh, you can then learn a whole lot from, from other birders. So, uh, and if people are interested, we can definitely do something on spring migration. Just, just drop something in the chat. And again, thank you for being here. I'm not going to go away. I'm going to just stop the um, recording and I will join everybody in the um, presentation. If, if anybody wants to hang out and ask questions, I'm, I'm here for the duration. <laughs>